We're good? All right. All right. We are back with another episode of Integrative Wellness Radio. I'm here with Dr. Nick. Hello. He's going to do his awkward hello like he hello, always hello, does. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> so uh, as we are approaching the, or I, I guess I should say as we are in the full-fledged winter months, um, one of the things we wanted to talk about today was seasonal affective disorder. And this is pretty much a description for people that notice that their mood really takes a turn as we uh, are in these winter months. I think a lot of us are, you know, really hyped up around the holidays. We're really busy. There's a lot of, you know, things going on, a lot of social gatherings. And then once we cross over into that January um, you know, time frame, all of a sudden we start noticing that we feel what we call the winter blues and we're usually waiting uh, very patiently for summer to come. Sometimes not so patient. <laughs> that is true. We've, we've already been planning our uh, trip to Puerto Rico, <laughs> being here in the uh, lovely Northeast. So, so just kind of getting into what is seasonal affective disorder, it's obviously feeling, you know, these winter blues, we can call it. Um, but there's actually a physiological reason for it. And I think a lot of times we think that, you know, there's so much fun stuff going on in the summer. You know, there's obvi obviously sunshine. There's a lot more outdoor activities and we're constantly outside and socializing. And we kind of assume that that might be the reason why we like summer so much more. But it actually has a physiological change when we are in the sunlight um, in addition to really changing the way that our brain is functioning. Yeah, and there's, I mean, it's it's a lot more complex than a lot of, uh, what, I guess, what the Google searches will, will come up and mm -hmm. show you. Uh, a lot of it just comes to, they think it's a lack of, a lack of sunshine, a lack of exposure to light and how that affects us mm -hmm. in many different ways. Um, but like you said, it's like, you're just getting over the hump of holidays, that stress, you're not eating properly, it's cold out, you're not working out as much. Like there's there's a lot of factors that go into it for sure. Yeah, and when it comes down to one of the biggest um, neurotransmitter culprits behind seasonal affective disorder is it has to do with the lack of serotonin. And you know, one thing one thing that we talk about a lot in our practice is when people feel low, it's always assumed that it's a serotonin problem because our route of care usually is going to be SSRIs, which are antidepressants, which strictly focus on serotonin. But in the event of seasonal affective disorder, it really does come down to a lack of serotonin. And there's a couple of reasons for that. But secondary, there is a lot that you can do to boost your serotonin without necessarily having to go down the road of medications and their side effects as well. And we're going to be talking about that. Um, but some of the key symptoms to be aware of in the event that you do truly have a serotonin deficiency is you will have seasonal affective disorder, number one. So what is seasonal affective disorder? So seasonal affective disorder is when you have a lower mood in the winter months. So you're borderline depressed? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I don't like to call it depressed because some people feel depressed. Some people just kind of feel a little bit low. And when you're from New Jersey, you're super stubborn and will never admit that you're depressed, even if you are. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's not a fun thing to come to terms with that you're not feeling, you know. Your best. Yeah, right. Well, and I think that, you know, we can put a label on it. We can call it depressed. But at the end of the day, there's a reason for it. And that's why I don't really love using those types of labels. And, you know, one thing that you can notice is that you start losing pleasure in things that you normally like to do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe in the summer you love to go out and socialize with your friends and you love to go to the beach and you love to go out to dinner or, you know, grab lunch. And, you know, in the winter you're just like, I just want to hibernate. I don't want to do any of those things. And there's a difference between, quote unquote, like depression that, you know, something happens in your life and it causes you to be sad versus you don't have any idea where it's coming from. And just all of a sudden you're not you're not yourself anymore. Oh, 100 percent. And that's the thing is sometimes there's going to be a trigger that really can compromise how you feel. And then sometimes there you're just like, what's going on with me? And that can come down to, you know, s that transition into those winter months that is, you know, causing the neurotransmitter imbalance to start to happen. 
and, you know, losing the pleasure in the things that you like the most or, you know, just kind of not necessarily even just feeling low, but also shifting into feeling really, really irritable. Those are some of the key signs that your serotonin is low in the first place. And you might have lower serotonin than the average person, but it might dip even further when you get into the winter months. So it's like you could already have a problem, but it wasn't really showing any signs and symptoms, but then you get into the winter months and the lack of sunshine, the lack of everything else, then that compounds to actually having a, a physical problem. Yeah. Well, I think that when you're dealing with, you know, the, the lower serotonin too is you might just find your coping skills with stress to be not very good that you're very overwhelmed by a stressor that somebody else is like, well, what's the big deal? So it manifests so differently. And I think that's a really important fact to make is that nothing necessarily matches the textbook. Nothing necessarily matches what WebMD says. And there's a lot of different manifestations of how we can feel if our neurotransmitters are off. It's not super black and white. I don't think anything in medicine is black <laughs> and white, actually. <laughs> um, so going into you know, some of the, the common things that we're going to see when we're dealing with the low serotonin is number one is we're going to have a lack of amino acids, which I will explain further what that actually means. We might see a vitamin D deficiency, again, because the lack of sunlight that we're getting exposed to in the winter months the other big one really comes down to how well our pancreas is working, how well we are producing something called insulin, which really, to sum that up, is how well is our body handling sugar and are we getting too much sugar in our diet? Hence coming off the holidays, the stress and everything else. Exactly. So when you're talking about this seasonal affective disorder and feeling low in the winter is you go through the win or the um, holiday season and we're compounded not just with the actual holidays but all the social gatherings all the you know the work parties and the friends parties and then our families parties and we're usually overindulging in not just sweets but also tons of carbohydrates and alcohol probably and alcohol even if it's fancy alcohol. <laughs> it still gets broken down in the sugar. <laughs> well, one of our mentors who's an expert in brain health, I remember um, one of the things he said was, he's like, alcohol degenerates your brain. He's like, even if it is high-end, like $200 bottles of wine. And I was like, that is true. <laughs> so so it's not a necessarily when it comes to alcohol, you know, obviously choosing better quality is is important. But at the end of the day, all alcohol breaks down into is sugar. So we kind of have this overindulgence of all of these different items that are being broken down into sugar. And by the time we get out of the holiday season, our pancreas is like, please help. <laughs> please help. Why did you do this to me? So, so not only are we going to have a shift in our neurotransmitters, serotonin being the main one, because of the lack of light, but then in addition, it's because serotonin highly, highly, highly relies on how well our body is handling our blood sugar. And I mean, I know why, but is what's the imbalance of blood sugar do to, I guess, the pathway to for serotonin to be produced? Yes. And I want to, I definitely want to keep that as simple as possible, but before kind of getting into that pathway, I want people to be able to identify if they actually have a blood sugar problem because when you're coming out of the holidays, chances are you're more in the higher blood sugar realm. But even if you have low blood sugar, which is called hypoglycemia, that's also an issue. So the hypoglycemia, because Nick and I are kind of interesting, before we went through our own health journey, we actually were polar opposites. He was running in the higher blood sugar and I was running in the, the lower blood sugar. So for me, I was waking up not hungry, almost like had an aversion to eating in the morning because it would almost make me feel a little nauseous. That's all signs of hypoglycemia. And then in addition to that, you kind of wait until lunch, you get to the point that you're absolutely starving and then you're usually craving sugar and carbohydrates at that point. So then you spike your blood sugar, crash, and you're hungry, you know, two hours later. 
So with that being said, um, you're going to feel hungry potentially more often after you have that first meal, but then secondary to that, you're going to not necessarily feel hungry in the morning. Right. And that's the typical manifestation of the hypoglycemia. When you're on the hyper side, I'll let you kind of explain a little bit more about like the symptoms that you're feeling with that. Well, hangriness is uh, a big part of it. Yeah, you can tell that hangry is the joke when somebody's hungry. Their mood changes really fast and they get angry. So it's hungry plus angry is hangry. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know if you were angry. You were just silent. Yeah, when he well, was silent for extended amounts of time, I'm like, somebody needs to eat. Yes. Um, and and that's just because it's kind of the, it's the reverse opposite. You still have the big changes um, from the blood sugar change, uh, but it's like. You, you're running. I mean, I was craving a lot of sugar all the time, mm -hmm. and and especially after dinner. Yes. Yeah, and that is like a telltale: is you want sugar after most meals, but you especially want sugar after dinner as well. So the cravings in someone who's running on the higher blood sugar side, the cravings for sugar are more abundant. And before I knew better, I was like, but I'm eating healthy sugar. Yeah. It's dark chocolate, organic, fair trade, and helping kids, like, <laughs> but not myself. Yeah. So, and obviously when you get to the more extremes of the blood sugar running high for long periods of time, you obviously put yourself at risk for becoming diabetic. But before you become diabetic, you become something called insulin resistant. And insulin resistant is pretty much when the insulin allows your body to use the sugar properly because technically your brain does run on glucose, runs on sugar. But if your insulin is working, then your brain will use the glucose as fuel. If your insulin is not working, then you are not going to actually use the sugar properly. And the sugar is just going to float around in your body and it's going to make you feel achy. It's going to make you feel foggy. It's going to make you fatigued and then it will make you crave. Right. And then looking at blood results, a lot of doctors and people are only looking at glucose, um, which mm -hmm. is just a small snippet in quote unquote real time for the most part. Uh, but if you want to get a more accurate, you know, long term view of how somebody's handling their blood sugar, you need to look at the A1C. And you can also run fasting insulin too. Sure. Yeah. So if you look at all of those markers in the blood work, you really get a clearer picture of where your body is at. Um, and, you know, just kind of a side note, too, is some of you listening might be thinking, you know, I've gotten my blood work done and I've come up as pre-diabetic, but I don't eat sugar. So when you're dealing with sugar in the body, yes, obviously, there's going to be an exposure from what you're putting in your mouth. But you can also have a dysfunctioning pancreas, which is has to do with your insulin levels. Um, due to infections as well. And I don't want to dive too deep into that because we've talked about this on another podcast in relation to um, pancreatic function and some of the infections that can be there. But overall, if you're somebody who dealt with really long-term um, indigestion, heartburn, reflux, and you had those issues, chances are those issues were actually caused by an infection in your stomach your stomach and pancreas being embedded in each other will cause those infections to potentially affect the pancreas. So for those of you that are dealing with, you know, blood sugar instability, but you don't eat sugar, you need to look, you need to go a different route. Might be more infectious. Exactly. Exactly. Or toxic. Or yeah. toxic. Right. Yes. It, it could be either one of those. Um, but kind of circling back to the topic of, you know, when we're really getting into understanding the seasonal affective disorder. So your question was, okay, so the blood sugar, you know, the vitamin D light, like how is this actually affecting the pathway? Well, interesting enough is, um, there are foods that actually contain serotonin, but the problem is, is that serotonin cannot pass the lovely barrier around your brain called the blood-brain barrier. But a different precursor to serotonin, which is called tryptophan, uh, tryptophan is what is in turkey, and that's what they say makes you tired um, when you, you know, eat turkey on Thanksgiving, and I, I will bust that myth in just a moment. But um, And it's because serotonin is more of an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Yes, and an excess of serotonin can definitely make you drowsy, but a huge spike in your blood sugar and crash 
can also make you drowsy on Thanksgiving because we're not just eating turkey. We're eating stuffing and mashed potatoes and then we're eating, you know, sweets right after. So when you're dealing with that drowsiness on Thanksgiving, it might be tryptophan, but more than likely it's your blood sugar. It would have to be a lot of tryptophan. Yeah. <laughs> you would have to eat like the whole turkey. <laughs> um, it's turducken. <laughs> <laughs> so the tryptophan will cross the blood-brain barrier and then hopefully convert into serotonin. But the problem is, is the only way the conversion happens is if you have proper amounts of insulin. So when we're talking about, you know, the balance, and one of the biggest things that Dr. Nick and I always say is it's not about what you do, it's about how you do it. So if you go and start reading up on seasonal affective disorder, you might read up and say like, oh, I can take supplements to help to boost that. Or, you know, I can, you know, eat a bunch of eggs and turkey to get more tryptophan. That's such a linear approach. You need to make sure that not only are you going to be getting the tryptophan in your diet, which is going to come primarily from turkey, cheese, eggs, salmon, and then on top of it, you need to also make sure that your blood sugar is stable. So they call me the keto queen now because I wrote about keto like 45 times for Mind Body Green. But in reality, that's actually one of the best diets for seasonal affective disorder because you're cutting out all your simple carbohydrates and you are really stabilizing your blood sugar. And then because keto is abundant in protein, you're getting a ton of tryptophan. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, and that's quote unquote still linear though. I mean, it's it's just looking at how diet can affect seasonal affective disorder, and we know that you know most quote unquote causes of depression come from serotonin, sometimes dopamine too. Mm -hmm. uh, but better than any SSRI mm -hmm. is exercise, hands down, every mm -hmm. single time. So yeah. a lot of it also is just you know let's get out and let's move and mm -hmm. when we exercise we pump the blood around we get more oxygen we get more nutrients to the brain uh with that we're also sweating we're allowed to detox we're improving our lymphatic system so like there's so many aspects to you don't have to go too crazy and focus just on one thing mm -hmm. it's like let's Balance. do yep let's do a little bit in all these different systems and pathways of the body and really get uh, a global change happening. Mm -hmm. And what's the biggest thing that we don't want to do in the winter because it's cold is oh. we don't want to work out. <laughs> well, we don't want to go outside. So it's like, and most people go to a gym to work out or go to a yoga class or yeah. go to something. So it's like we stay inside because we'd rather snuggle up and watch Netflix <laughs> or read a book. So. It's true. It's true. So, and I'm really glad that you said about the exercise and, you know, getting the blood moving and getting the oxygen to the brain. Because at the end of the day, when it comes down to the three things that your brain really, really needs is it needs proper uh, blood sugar handling. It needs oxygen, which comes down to how well is your blood flowing and stimulation. So sitting down and watching Netflix versus reading the book, that's completely different stimulation to your brain when you're actually doing some type of, you know, even a crossword puzzle or you're reading, like that is true quality stimulation to the brain. So like Dr. Nick said, it's not about being linear. If you gravitate towards the ketogenic diet, that's gonna be great from a dietary standpoint. Making sure you're getting some level of exercise in is absolutely essential for the oxygen to get to the brain. And then, you know, on top of that, being able to provide some type of stimulation. Right. And that is going to vary person to person because do something that you actually like. You know, don't force yourself to read, but you don't love to read. Listen to an audio book or, mm -hmm. you know, do some type of, you know, crossword puzzle. Go to bingo. I don't know. <laughs> and, and while you're doing that, you, I mean, especially it depends on the severity of the, the seasonal affective disorder, but you can increase the stimulation with one of the major things we're missing, which is sunshine. So mm -hmm. you can go on to Amazon or wherever and purchase just, it's called a white light, mm -hmm. uh, which literally has, for the most part, all the spectrums uh, of light that the sun would give you. Mm -hmm. It's white light you really don't see. It's not like uh, a bright, bright light. Mm -hmm. um, not fluorescent. Not, no. It's, Let's be very clear on that. <laughs> it's white light. You could type in seasonal affective disorder, white light oh, uh, okay. therapy, and tons of things will come up. Mm -hmm. um, you want to get higher flux. Uh, Lower the flux is just lower intensity, and you're going to have to sit in it longer to get the effect. Mm -hmm. um, but that's also going to drive up a lot of those neural uh, pathways. Why don't we have one of these? <laughs> I don't know. 
Nice. It just sounds great overall. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a bad thing to have. It's, a, it's just another tool. Yeah, well, again, and if you're going to just, you know, say, screw the diet, I'm just going to focus on the light, you're probably going to hit a plateau. Right. So it's a very important to not look super linear at health, wellness, medicine, because unfortunately, we've all been programmed to think that way. And that's what keeps us just hitting plateaus. And it just keeps us feeling really mediocre. And, you know, I think that that's something that a lot of us as a society have settled for is just not feeling our best um, and normalizing a lot of our symptoms. You know, a lot of us are dealing with seasonal affective disorder. I know that I used to deal with it tremendously. And, you know, we it was just kind of like, well, just power through, keep yourself busy until, you know, summer comes. Let's get to summer. Let's get to summer. Which is such an interesting thing because – I live in New Jersey. <laughs> There's a lot more months that it's cold and dreary than it is, you know, actually warm and sunny. So uh, so it's like a very interesting thing to adapt to. But there's obviously tools out there that can help you to bridge that gap. So you're not necessarily just sitting around waiting for, you know, the, the happier days. For sure. For sure. So what would you say, like, top three things somebody can do um, to make a change really quick? Well, I think using the tools that we talked about today is establishing, do you have low blood sugar? Do you have high blood sugar? Do you just have blood sugar handling issues in the first place? But I, do you resonate with those you know, patterns that we described earlier in the podcast? Um, secondary to that, do you eat protein? Do you eat things that are actually even giving you exposure to the tryptophan? Which again, really comes down to animal products. It comes down to cheese, salmon, turkey, eggs. So if you are vegan, you might need to supplement. You you might need to take actual tryptophan because you are not obviously getting that through your diet, which is absolutely essential for the production of your serotonin. Would you take tryptophan or would you also take like any other amino acids? 5-HTP is one of the more common. Um, I do find personally, uh, clinically, more success with taking tryptophan. Yeah, and I do too. It's just like 5-HTP, it's usually it's 5-HT is part of the problem, but it's the pathway below the 5-HT that's not being... Exactly. Actually. Also too, for those of you that are going to go that route, you absolutely need B6. You absolutely need B6. It's part of the pathway to create the conversion. So just make sure that you are handling your blood sugar issues. You are taking the tryptophan, but there are a lot of products that contain tryptophan plus B6, and those are more balanced products, or you could just take it separately. So, um, so that's a really, really important thing. Um, get outside, you know, even though it's cold on a sunny day, get outside, move around, do something that you get both benefits. You get the, the vitamin D, you get the light therapy. And then in addition, you're getting some type of, you know, stimulation, oxygenation to the brain as well. And stimulation wise, I know that, you know, I think we take for granted stimulation on the brain just because, you know, in our profession, we're always like reading and learning and evolving. But, you know, there's many people that haven't done any stimulation on their brain in a really long time. And I think that when you want to gauge how understimulated your brain is, is, you know, there's a couple simple uh, examples. If you are someone who goes and you have to do a long drive, maybe it's like two, three, four hours, and you are fatigued, physically fatigued, that's mental. That's a mental fatigue because you are not stimulating your brain often. Even if you do, you know, if you start to read a book and that you fall asleep. It actually comes back to a cranial nerve weakness um, mm -hmm. because actually when you're driving, it's like your body's not moving, but you have all these lines yeah. uh, and the roads that your eyes are tracking, and then they get mm -hmm. fatigued and that waste a lot of energy. So that mm -hmm. usually comes back to a cranial nerve um, or cerebellum weakness. And cranial nerves are part, part of, the, of brain. the brain. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of different things that you can evaluate to see, like, is your, is your brain being stimulated? If you read a book and you are falling asleep within, you know, the first 10 to 20 minutes of reading that book, that's also showing that your brain is understimulated. So you need to kind of work up the threshold to get your brain stimulated so that you're not going to be so fatigued by doing activities as well. 
So those are all, I think, the most important things when you're considering, like, what can I do naturally and alternatively for the seasonal affective disorder? Awesome. Good stuff. <laughs> so with all of that being said, you know, I, I hope that it opens your eyes to say, wow, it's very interesting how I have seasonal affective disorder and the traditional conventional approach is a pill. And nobody's talking about the rest of the pieces of the puzzle. So when you're going that pill route, that might be what you want to do. But unfortunately, you probably will hit a plateau. And that's when they either up your dose or they change the medication. And then you just keep going round and round and round. So that's really the most important thing is when you kind of look at the big picture, you'll create results that are sustainable. Yeah. And a lot of those, you know, medications that you'll be on will end up flooding the neurotransmitter site and eventually causing uh, a backlash and then mm -hmm. hits the fan. I'm actually glad you said that because an overabundance of serotonin actually induces anxiety. And how many of us are dealing with anxiety? That is probably the biggest complaint that I have coming into our clinical practice is anxiety. And, and most of the people are on medication. Yeah. And it's getting worse. Yeah. So uh, so don't necessarily be fooled by the, the one pill cure all because it's going, especially, especially when you're dealing with neurotransmitters like serotonin is any neurotransmitter. It is a fine, fine line. It is not about being overabundant. And it's not about being underabundant. You need it to be in perfect balance. So that's unfortunately why the use of medications, they, they usually have side effects, number one. And number two is you usually cap out at a certain point. <laughs> we did it. Crashed it. <laughs> so thank you guys for listening so much. Um, we are going to be back with you next week talking about vascular dementia, which is actually associated with how oxygenation to the brain can be a culprit for uh, brain and memory decline. So we're actually going to be diving a little bit deeper into that topic. But uh, thank you for being with us, and we hope you enjoyed. Definitely check out integrativewellnessgroup.com if you are interested in checking out our practice in Belmar, New Jersey, and learning a little bit more about how we work with clients from all over the world. All right, guys. See you next time.